I was back in camp when I saw the broadcast. By the looks of it, three teams were about to fight, and there was no telling if we'd be able to stop all of this before eliminations happen. Hearth, get prodigal. Things are going wrong. Hearth nodded and looked into the distance. Ravazatik was broadcasting like normal, but hadn't been speaking to us much outside of that. Avoiding us? Possible. I'd threatened him, but there was something else. Then I heard Val's name and confirmed it. Something had shifted. Azoku came running up the bluff, Chathuxel shortly behind him. We will rush to Val's aid. I shook my head. Won't make it in time. This whole fight's gonna go down fast. Problem is, Val ain't a fighter. Top athlete, sure, but not a fighter. And all those guys are fighting for their survival. Damn it. I wish I could step in or... Hearth. Hearth turned. I believe I understand what you wish to. How does your species comprehend this possibility, possibilities? Science. Fiction. You make up stories to extrapolate future possibilities for entertainment. Not now. Is it possible? Hearth pondered for a moment. It is possible. Theoretically. With trills, it would be simple, but your minds are different than ours. Humans more than the other species. And you more than that. It could be dangerous. No hesitation. Do it. Hearth nodded one final time, laying a hand on my shoulder and I got the sudden feeling of when an elevator started moving. What I was sensing shifted, and with a lurch, I realized what it was. I was connected through Hearth and Prodigal to Val. The screens were darting forward, taking advantage of Val grabbing the attention of the others. And now it was a melee. Val shouted for Shine to go for the screens while she was charging the larger goal. Attached, I knew the moves to bring him down and fell back on my training. Val was startled for a moment, but she followed it. She hopped, twisting her body, and caught the lock she was looking for, both of them tumbling to the ground, and she came up on top, planting her knee on his neck. I felt Keith's memories, different ones this time. Instead of him broadcasting pain, it was his memories of fighting, the memories of someone else who had spent their whole life training, just a different kind. I saw what he wanted me to do in a fraction of a second and complied, bringing the big man down and planting my knee as he struggled under me. Now what? My hand went up instinctively, aware of the hatchet thrown by one of the Vendrix. It was pure instinct as I caught the handle of the hatchet just as I felt the female goal coming from the other direction. Instead of trying to stop the momentum, I shifted it and let the hatchet fly. The blunt back of the hatchet connected with her forehead and she was stunned. Where the hell did you learn that one, Keith? Not me. There was no time, and I had an opening. I charged, tackling her at the waist, and took her to the ground. The images that came to me were straightforward, and using the flat of my own hatchet against her temple, I knocked her out, grabbing her wristband. I looked around, and the fight was everywhere. Shin had rushed the Skrens, and I watched as he hopped off a tree, extending both feet the same as I had when I'd drop-kicked him before, and one Skren went down. The other tried to run, but Shin was faster. Meanwhile, Prodigal had the Vendrix coming at him. They tag-teamed him, keeping up a constant stream of attacks at the trill, but every swing missed, Prodigal sidestepping. Meanwhile, the big goal was struggling up from the ground on his hands and knees. The images from Keith's head weren't from training this time, but something from UFC. It looked good, and I rushed back, diving over his back and grabbed on. I wrapped one arm around his neck, using the other to secure it, while my legs wrapped around his waist, locking me in place. And as he struggled to break free, I locked the hold in tighter, cutting off his air. For a time, he thrashed around and ended up on top of me, but I just held on. It felt like minutes, but I'm certain it was faster than that. His struggles lessened, and I felt his body relax, and finally stop moving. Releasing the grip, I followed the next image and checked for his heartbeat and it was still beating, so I took his wristband. The goal were down for the moment at least. The Skrens had been wrapped up by Shin, who was beaming, and we both began advancing on the Vendrix. Shin, take their wristbands! Vendrix, stop! One, a woman with blonde hair and purple eyes looked to me, the two Goal and Shin, retrieving wristbands from the fallen Skrens. She muttered something, which I assume was a curse, and signaled her teammate. The Vendrix knew they were done. Why do you take the wristbands? To halt elimination. 
We want you in our tribe. We're not enemies. I kept it a matter of fact, as I fished out the boon bag for the Vendrix and tossed it to her. Your people sent us this to show trust. We want to beat the real enemy, the Cathral Dominion. Now, I have to break down an alien deer. Shin, prodigal, secure the screns and goal. She opened the bag and pulled out a string of clay coins with holes in the middle to keep them all on the same string. She looked up, startled, and I went over to the creature this whole thing had started over. As I knelt down, I got images of an old man with a thick white mustache wearing a John Deere cap and camo. He was smiling and instructing, Pop Pop. Keith's grandfather taught him how to break down his first deer. I followed the instructions, removing the innards, careful not to puncture the stomach, and put them in a separate bag, then removed the hide and worked on breaking the animal down, Pop Pop's instructions in my head the whole way. As I finished up, I could see the goal and Skrens bound to trees, and the Vendrix seemed to be standing by, waiting to find out what happened next. The goals had come awake, but bound as they were, there was no chance of escape. I got up and went to the Skrens first, who seemed to be more calculating. I have a gift from your people here. We're not your enemies, and we have a camp, with food, water, and shelter. I gave them the bag and untied them. It still looked like they would bolt for a moment, but one produced a small pouch from the bag. You bring us this? How did you get this? I told you. Your people sent us this. We don't want to fight you, and we took your wristbands so you couldn't be eliminated when we knocked you out. You don't have to come, but it's better if you do. I knelt down, bringing myself level with them. The Skrens didn't immediately agree, but they didn't run, so I'd take it. I felt Keith's presence leave my mind, and honestly, I felt a little bad when it did. It was weird, but getting to see his pop-pop was nice. I turned to the final group, who were clearly none too pleased. You are the goal. I am Val, and I am not your enemy. This is a boon from your people to show you that I speak the truth. Join our tribe. I came back to myself and hit the ground immediately. Every color and point of light was intensified, and my vision was swimming. My senses were screaming, even just the feel of the ground beneath me. I shut my eyes and had Hearth help me back to my shelter. I cut off as much of my senses as I could and just focused on my own breathing. I know Hearth was speaking, but for the life of me, it was all just a cacophony, and it was a release when I passed out of consciousness. Oddly, the female spoke first. You have bested us both in combat. We are bound to your command now. I sighed and began untying them. I need none to command, and the stakes are too high. Here's my command. I command you to choose for yourselves. You can choose to join us, or you can choose to keep fighting alone. Either way is on you. She looked around at the piles of meat laying on the hide and stood up as the ropes fell away. We choose to join then. Once the goal agreed, the Skrens joined, and the Vendrix just nodded. The goal woman retrieved her species boon bag and produced a necklace with a leather strap, and with multiple fangs and claws hanging from it. She pulled it close to her chest, offering a prayer, and put it on. What now? I was breathing heavily. We go home and take our food with us. We'll have more there. We trudged home, splitting up the meat between groups, the goal taciturn, while the Skrens seemed to have taken a keen interest in Shin. The Vendrix, though, walked with me. I'm Marilla, Re of Donkreth, and this is Fionn, head of my personal guard. Valerie, but I go by Val. Nice to meet you, but I don't have any fancy titles. She smiled. This is fine. Titles mean little here, and I've recently become aware of how truly small they are in the grand scheme. How many are in this tribe? I nodded. Tell me about it. As to the tribe, me and Keith are human. Then we have the Ruthani, Asu, Virgil. And now, the lot of yourselves. I know the goal are physical beasts, and the Skrens are small and quick. What is your species known for? She positively beamed. I am known far and wide as the greatest of merchant queens. I own the roots on which the suns never set. Many rivals I have had in my rise, and now I stand over all of them. By the level of pride, I guessed her species put a lot of stock in mercantile efforts. That meant she had skills we did need. While it might sound silly, that helps us a great deal right now. While we've got people who are strong, good fighters, builders, and survivalists, we're a bit shallow on people who know how to run things. 
everything is sort of going up on a purely needs-of-the-moment basis. It would be nice to be able to have someone who knows how to manage projects. Valerie, Keith has fallen due to severe sensory overload. He is currently asleep in the shelter, but otherwise fine. The fault is ours. His will was becoming stretched and frayed, and so we cut the connection, unaware of the side effects, until it was too late. Had we eased it off, this would not have happened. We both apologize for this error. Prodigal bowed his head as he gave me the news. It's fine, Prodigal. Even if he'd known the cost, it's Keith. He'd have paid it without a second thought on the matter. I kept getting to know Keith at a deeper level, and there was no part of him that was just going to leave our fight up to chance if he had a choice. It wasn't in him, and now I knew the truth of it. It was never in him. Some of the fractions of memories I'd picked up related to fighting showed me a child facing off against an older boy to protect a classmate who, earlier that day, had been Keith's bully. It didn't matter he was bigger, or that he had friends, or that the person he was protecting had wronged him. The older boy was being a bully, and Keith wouldn't let it happen. I thought about my own childhood. Would I have been like that? Sigh. No. If I'm being honest, I'd have probably joined in on the bullying. It was only after I got pregnant that I started to see my own behavior, how I'd treated others. And it was a girl I'd talked shit about who had been there when I found out and hugged me, and told me that everything would be all right. A premier athlete at a young age, I was popular and attractive, and I didn't much consider others unless they were in my own circles. I'm certain that Marilla was talking, but realized I wasn't really listening. She contented herself with talking with the others, and gave me space. With breaks, we eventually reached the glade, although by now it was looking much less like a glade. The Rothanian Asu had been pushing to get the ground ready for tilling, and started outlining a path around to the switchback. Up top, the basic structures of our first yurts were coming together. Marilla let out a slow whistle. You weren't overselling things here, I see. You did all of this inside of a week? I shook my head. Not just me. The Rothani, Asu, and Virgil have been a huge help. The Virgil do most of our hunting right now. The Asu do a good degree of scouting and gathering, while the Rothani do physical labor. I cook and switch between jobs, just depending on which groups needs extra hands. Keith's injured for now, since the cougar attack, so while he heals up, he works around the camp itself, brings in fish, makes rope, a lot of the small work that needs doing. He'll get back to the big stuff once his shoulder's back to rights. Probably before then, if I'm being completely honest. Her face scrunched up. Just order him to stay in the camp until he is healed. Seems simple enough. I sighed. If only. It doesn't work like that for our species. We're all obstinate and independent by nature, even those who are generally well disposed toward working as a group. I order him to stay in camp. I might as well order him to leave the camp, because that's going to happen. We were nearly halfway back, taking a break in the shade, when we heard it. Shin and the Skrens caught it first, the ears suddenly perking and diverting in the same direction. Then Prodigal spoke up. Incoming advanced minds, too. I sense anxiety, desperation, and a faint trace of hope. I sense no aggression. The second mind is in extreme pain, and the first is panicked. Their minds are all over the place. Okay, prodigal, prepare to broadcast my speech to their minds. Everyone else, we have people coming in. Remember, they are not the enemy. The Cathral are. There are only two of them, and nine of us. They'd have to be madmen to decide to rush us all. Then came the crashing and crying out as a humanoid came running through the brush toward us. I had to halt the goal as they readied to fight. The male was one of the inod, purple-skinned, angular features, and four eyes. The center pair of eyes looked forward, while the second pair were angled off. He was stumbling and at his limit. I saw his head above the brush. And then I saw him carrying the other, a woman, her stomach distended in a very familiar way to me as she cried out. He was screaming to us, but Prodigal couldn't get a bead on their thoughts, and the translators were having trouble with it. But then I didn't need it. Shin! Run for camp, get Keith and his EMT bag. Prodigal, do whatever you can to calm him, and... Biggins, what's your name? The male goal snapped his head around. I am Traig, son of Gorach. Right, questions for later. Traig, protect this group and follow our tracks back. The Inod male needs to rest. Catch up with us when he's ready to go, but don't push him or he'll pass out. 
I ran up to the Anod. What's her name? He seemed to understand, even if I could not understand him. Zira. I gave the universal signal for him to give her over to me. My tribe mate is a healer. I'm taking her there. Rest and catch up when you're rested. He meekly made a motion with his head that wasn't really a nod or shake, but understood, and allowed me to take Zira. Trying to walk at normal speed was out of the question, but would Keith even be ready by the time I got back? I tested the weight of her as I held her, and something interesting happened. Her skin tone lightened where it touched my skin, going to a lighter shade of purple, and I felt her breathing calm a little bit. She had felt cold, but then, so had the male. Otherwise, she didn't seem to weigh all that much to me, and so I started off, first at a light jog, and picking up speed as we hit the game trails. Shin had left a whole trail of his hot marks, giving a clear path for me to follow. Running as we were, it was as we approached the glade that I heard Shin calling out, and when I saw him, he had Ragnar and Greltha coming up behind him, and like a truly perverse relay race, they took Zira off my hands, and I took a moment of collapsing to the ground. When I regained my breathing, I forced myself up and ran up for the bluff. There was no way I was missing a berth in the middle of everything horrible thing we'd been through. When I got back to camp, I was shocked. A hasty shelter had been erected, using leftover tarp, rope, and had even been given a tarp floor covering, with essentially a table made of containers that had been strapped together around the sides. Keith was blinking a bit, and I saw the signs of the aftermath from the link. Keith, are you all right to do this? Yeah, not my first rodeo. Let me see your wristband. He said, not really awaiting my response, and hit the green button on her wristband. As before with the other species, the Inod liaison popped up in hologram. This is Keith of Earth. I need you to talk to me until I can understand your words. We're trying to render aid to this woman, but I don't know your biology, and I'll need help talking me through it. The male on the screen seemed taken aback and started talking, repeating the same thing over and over until... Tell me when you can understand me. Got it. While he was doing that, Keith was draping Zira in his winter coat and clearing a small area to work. This was something for him that was second nature. I took the moment to crash to the ground, and if Keith noticed, he said nothing, instead giving orders to Shin, who fished an emergency blanket out Keith's bag, balled it up as a pillow for the woman, while Keith got the coat on her. He produced what I think was sanitizer from his bag, then donned gloves and a face shield. Val, I know you're tired, but I need you over here. Hold her hand and just help her along. What's your name, ma'am? He said with an air of calm in his voice that was surprising. Zera, you are a healer. Where is Nogrex? Her voice seemed a little weak, but she was clearly aware of what was going on. Nogrex is your companion, right? He got you to us, and Val here ran you back immediately. According to Prodigal, he's all right, and he'll be along, but he had to rest. Don't worry. He's safe with us, and we have food and water for you. That same even tone, but I got the impression he wasn't telling the whole truth. Keith turned to the screen. All right. I need to know if she can use certain medications so I can give her something for pain. The liaison didn't seem to know quite what to do, but eventually an Inod medical expert was brought up, and he and Keith went back and forth as he held up various medicines for inspection, rattling off chemical names and descriptions of the drugs, as well as how they worked. He was moving quickly and kept relaying orders to people. Even with only one arm and hung over, he was still right on point. He made sure to structure the room in such a way that there would be as much privacy as he could get away with. And content with his instructions from the Inod doctor, engaged privacy mode, stating he would call back if he needed further help. In the course of things, we were interrupted by the returning group, and yes, Keith had lied. Treg was carrying Nogrex on his back, and the Inod male was unconscious, his skin a pale green color. I motioned to Keith, and he looked up for a moment, swore to himself, and sent Greltha to go check things out, having me stay where I was, soothing her, giving her water, and even small bits of food that she gratefully ate. Greltha came back, whispering something to Keith as he continued his work, and Keith quietly said something back. Greltha nodded and went back out. I was startled when the actual birth happened, long after the privacy mode had expired. Zira had gritted her teeth through the pain, and then suddenly there was crying from Keith's end. And, congratulations, Zira, it's a girl. 
Zira made a labored, chortling sound, and after cleaning the baby off, Keith had put it in a diaper that had clearly been made out of one of his shirts, swaddled her, and handed her to Zira, who was crying. Keith, meanwhile, stripped off gloves, and the jury rigged smock and face shield. All right, Ducky, need you in here for a bit. Val, I'm pretty sure we both need a minute. We stepped outside, and once we were away from the tent, I got to those false statements earlier. What happened to Nogrex? Keith took a moment to answer. He passed out. Prodigal sensed it before it happened, and they managed to get his wristband. I need to talk with their medical folks again, but I'm pretty sure it was just exertion and dehydration from what Greltha found out. After everything, especially the neural link, I was just so worn out. So when the Vendrix woman Marilla came up, I sighed. I knew this would be yet another thing before she started speaking. Greetings. You must be Keith. I am Marilla, and I believe we need to speak as a group. Yeah, I'm Keith, but you're gonna have to give a minute here now. I need a proper wash-up before I go having a chat with y'all. My apologies for not being here to greet y'all when you arrived, but things went kinda sideways on me there for a bit. Marilla bowed her head a slight bit in acknowledgement. That is fully understandable, but I do believe we have a number of things to discuss that are of import. I nodded, made my excuses, and went over to where we had rigged up the shower. I washed everything up and got myself changed into a different shirt, then came back out. This whole past week had been one insane thing after another, and it wasn't slowing down. Now the Inod presented a new issue, beyond the baby. We hadn't gone looking for them. They had come looking for us. Yeah, it was optimal for what I was going for, but at the same time, it was a huge issue. I checked on Nogrex, and it wasn't just the overexertion, but he clearly hadn't been eating properly. I called Ducky over, and had her bring him hot broth and to let him rest. Marilla was waiting by the fire and she wasn't alone. Treg had wandered off, but his companion was there, as was Azoku and Val. Prodigal and Hearth were going dormant for the evening, and I could hear the sounds of Ragnar and Greltha getting to work. The timing did seem rather intentional, and Marilla as well as confirmed this when I approached. Ah, uh, Keith, good. Are we ready to talk? Apparently, we need to talk as a mood transcended species lines. I imagine so. Let me start off here. I'm Keith Morehouse, of Earth, and I've realized that there's a flaw in the game. The basic principle of these games is that it goes until only one species remains. If all of us unify, however, then that state can't occur, and we can block the game. It's like cooperative games on Earth, where we're not really playing against one another, but the game itself. That's the situation here. Marilla did that same slow head bow. As may be, but we need to speak on more practical concerns. The reason we have these particular people is specific. Obviously, Val is your compatriot, myself to represent the Vendrix, Hoda here for the Gol, and Azaku for the Virgil. We did not bring in the Rothani or the Asu because really, any of them will simply do whatever you say. The Inod would be here, but they are all currently indisposed, and the Trills have a dormancy period they must observe. You have added nine mouths to your tribe, Keith, and it has problems, especially since three of those new mouths are all medically unable to do anything of current, and our leader is crippled. She wasn't precisely attacking, but she was definitely making aggressive moves. Thankfully, Azaku spoke up. In fairness, Keith is healing from the Cougar fight and according to him, we'll be back to health in a matter of weeks. Even injured, though, Keith is the reason we had a steady supply of fish to supplement my and Chat Huxel's hunting. He's also made a number of the traps and snares that we use, and designed the shelters we're using. That comment threw Marilla for a moment, but she regained herself. It still stands that we do not necessarily have an unlimited set of supplies, and yet you still fight to bring all of the other species into this tribe even the sick and the injured. She was making a play for both leadership and to try and limit the field. She was being polite about it, but she had a clear agenda, and it was time to put a check to it. Yes, we are. That is the decision Val and I came to. Now, sure, we could have let the goal kick three kinds of shit out of you. Hoda grinned malevolently. But fact is, we made that choice. Now, if and y'all have a problem with following that, then put frankly, you're free to fuck off to whatever part of the planet you choose, since y'all were doing so great prior to this that y'all were willing to get into a seven-on-two fight for a single deer. 
That one hurt her, and she stumbled a moment. I decided not to give her the time. Now, I'm willing to hear suggestions on how to make sure everyone gets fed, but make no bones, just cause I talk slow. It don't mean I'm stupid. I promised Ravajatik when I threatened him, that I'd protect them all, and I mean to honor my word. You can be a part of that or not, but what I'm not gonna do is get backed into a corner on this. Hoda's grin intensified. For her at least, and I imagine Treg, the direct approach to it was best. Look, I get it. You're in a new group, and you're looking to make your place in it. But this ain't gonna be your show. So, what solutions you got for where we're at? Her eyes narrowed a moment, but then went back to her merchant's speech. Well, I would say, obviously, that the shelters need to be completed. It seems you've been working on a clay kiln, which is good, but I can improve that. We need everyone assigned to tasks, and a schedule for them, and with so many different species, we need some form of leadership aside from whatever you and Val come up with. Her points weren't entirely wrong. I'll think about the leadership thing, but honestly, right now, we gotta be focused on getting ourselves ready. Weather's been playing nice with us this past week, but something's brewing with those clouds I'm seeing. Aside from that, we're pulling in plants for crops, and the hunting and fishing is pretty good. Marilla cocked her head quickly to the side. No, they're not. They were good when you first started, but there are 17 of us now. Even if the trails don't properly eat, and the baby gets its food from its mother, that's 15, and the mother will need extra food just to stay healthy to feed her baby. Simple hunting is not going to be enough for that, especially on foot. I inhaled slowly, then held my breath a second. Well, there's a fair simple way of getting around that. We cheat. Now she looked confused. All right, so earlier, I did this whole neural link thing with Hearth and Prodigal. And while I was linked up, I got some of their senses and whatnot. So apparently, they don't just sense advanced minds. They sense all minds. There ain't been much of a reason for them to do anything with it. Since, like you said, they don't really eat. But they can sense the minds of animals and whatnot on about them. If we send them with the hunting team, we can use that for hunting. And once again, everyone's just staring at me. Marilla blinked a couple times. You... you let an alien species link your mind elsewhere? Why would you do that? Is that why Azaki was saying you weren't well when we arrived? Yeah, pretty much. But truth is, the problem wasn't the link. It was when they cut it. They just shut it down immediately, like they would with one of theirs. I wasn't ready for the shift back. Sort of like if you were deep in the ocean, then instantly above the surface, what the pressure change would do to you, and... Well, yeah, got kind of a hangover going. But other than that, I'm fine. Not even the worst one I've had, by far. And having been a combat medic in wartime, that was unfortunately true. Marilla Matt exasperated exhale that wasn't quite a sigh. I don't understand your species. Val smiled a bit. Neither do we. Now there's still a hunting issue, because even with Prodigal going with the hunting team, there's the weight limits. And if we overhunt, we'll be in trouble. Then there's the caloric expense of the hunting itself. We need a way to start bringing animals in, just like if we were ranching on Earth. Oh, this is going to be like that monster rancher game I used to play on deployment. Sorry, lost in thought. All right, so I think Hearth and Prodigal can help with that. Help us find the animals. Figure we get ourselves some of the birds, clip wings, and that'll give us some meat right there. Plus the eggs and feathers, unless we can find us some yard birds around here. Figure, grab a few of those deer and fence them in proper. That'd even help our farming, since we'd be getting fertilizer from it. Speaking of farms, we need to get serious about the planting part of it. Spring's moving along, and I want to make sure we're ready to go on that. As to teams, figure Treg, Azoku, and Prodigal for the hunt team. Farming team's gonna be Val, along with Hoda, Marilla, and Ducky. Fishing's gonna be me along with Nogrex when he's ready to the move. That should be enough, since we got the nets. Then there's Scavenge Team, which is Shin and the Skrens. Hearth stays to camp, since he's essentially the hub for Prodigal, and he can help out there. I'll also be working on whatever else I can on my end. Pretty much everyone else is going on the build team with Rognar and Greltha, to get us our shelters up. Marilla was taking notes now as I spoke, but didn't interrupt, waiting for me to finish. We have other things we need to look at as well. For one, storage. The containers are good enough for a number of things, being fully air and watertight, but we need more. 
Clay pots are good for that, but if want year-round growth, we need glass to make a hothouse. For that, we need sand from the beach, as well as salt for pickling and preserving, which brings us back to the beach. I would propose we cut a path or road to the beach for easier travel. But I'd like to bring up another thing, transportation. No offense to the goal, Virgil, and humans, but most of the rest of us aren't really built for the level of walking and running we keep having to do. You mentioned that the trills were able to sense the thoughts of animals. Could they also communicate with them? Because if so, then we could bring in species that would be able to serve as mounts. I scratched at the stubble on my chin. I hadn't rightly thought of that, Miss Marilla, but I'm pretty sure they can do that. And it would help us out in the long run. It'd also let us explore more. Maybe even find the source of the iron we've been finding along the river north of here. How do you know that the trails can do that? Marilla sat pensively, setting down her piece of charcoal. Oh, well, I mean, it's kind of conjecture, I'll admit. But the theory's sound, all figured. So, like, they can sense minds around them just like we hear, see, or feel. Their telepathy lets them get on in there and communicate around language gaps. That should mean they could actually be talking with the various critters about. That makes sense to you, Miss Marilla? I mean, the explanation makes sense, Keith, but that's not what I'm asking you. How do you know ways to use their abilities? She was sitting forward now, and her curiosity wouldn't be denied. It seems simple from my perspective, but I could see the others were a bit fascinated as well except Val, who seemed to understand the question and was choking back laughter. Well, I mean, I don't really, other than the fragments I picked up when I was linked with them earlier. The other stuff's just based on things I learned about potential ways mental powers might work, you know? Marilla was now showing agitation. Okay, let's make this simple. Are there humans with mental abilities along the lines of the trills? I shook my head and shrugged. Well. Not per se, I reckon. But it's stuff we've thought about a lot. She took a breath and closed her eyes for a second before responding, and Val was steadily losing the fight to keep from laughing. In answer to your previous question, no, we don't know. Aside from you two, no one here knows how you keep coming up with new ways to use the abilities of the trails. By your own statement, your species doesn't even have abilities like they do. I talked with Prodigal and Hearth, and even they're not clear on how you keep thinking about ways to use their capabilities, that even they haven't considered some of them despite living with these abilities their whole lives. Val finally lost the fight and was nearly crying she was laughing so hard. It brought the others around to her and she spoke up as she wiped a tear from her eye. Sorry, sorry. I know this is a serious conversation, but the answer's just ridiculous. Keith, I don't think any of these species, or the Cathrol, have science fiction. Well, shit. I'd been making the assumption that all these various species had stories of the supernatural from their species perspective, because why wouldn't they? Because humans are different. Ah, uh, shit. Sorry, okay. So on Earth, we have a pretty massive set of industries built around entertainment. One of our favorite pastimes as a species is creating made-up stories in various mediums. A large genre of this is called science fiction. Basically, it's a bunch of stories based around scientific principles, hypotheses, and theories. Of these stories, ones about supernatural abilities are a huge thing. For instance, what we call superheroes. As an example of that one, you've got Jean Grey, who in the stories is an incredibly power telepath. Marilla's facade slipped. She was just gawking at me, and I realized I'd just blown the minds of every non-human listening. There had to be a better way to explain. Got it. I hit the green button on my wristband and up popped Annabelle. Hey, Miss Annabelle. Sorry to be disturbing this evening, but I need a favor if and you can. Could you stream us a movie on this screen? Um, let me think. Uh, let's go with The Last Starfighter, thanks. Annabelle nodded, not quite sure what was going on, but a guy in a Tron shirt came on screen for a moment, and after about 10, 15 minutes, Annabelle cut away. I figured that the Cathrol had not thought of this in the rules, since, I mean, why would they? Who is going to call out to watch a random movie from their homeworld in the middle of a survival game? While that was in the works, I decided to press my luck and called out, Hey, Ravaja Tick, need to have a word with you. Don't it ain't bad, just some tech support shit. We'll be having another chat later about some stuff. 
Ravija Tick's screen popped up, and the man looked nervous. And what is it that you wanted to ask me, Survivor Keith? Well, about my screen with Annabelle. Can I increase the screen size? It's a bit small for what I'm trying to do here. Ravaja Teek seemed confused for a moment, but dismissed it. Yes, it's simple enough. There's an icon in the lower left corner. If you press it, there will be bar that can resize the image. Why do you need it larger? So I can show the tribe something from back home. Thanks. And broke the connection. I fiddled with the wristband controls from there, not only finding the controls to increase size, but volume, subtitles. There was even one for setting a fixed projection so I wouldn't have to stay still. Annabelle came back and apparently had gotten the go-ahead from her higher-ups. I set the screen to the size of a proper theater screen and got the volume up, then stabilized it. The screen went black for a moment, and up came the beginning of The Last Starfighter. Val came over to sit with me. You know, I've never seen this movie. I smiled. I figured, does this feel like a weird waste of time? Her smile brightened even more. Absolutely. And that's what's great about it. Everyone here's just been thinking about survival for a week, and it's like you said, we have to stop surviving as fast as possible. This is part of that. Several flashes of light went off behind us, and we looked back to see bags had been transported in. Inside the bags, it looked like a gang of overhyped 12-year-old had raided a concession stand. One of the bags was literally just a giant bag of movie theater popcorn, still warm. Others contained various kinds of pop and just so much candy. Yet another bag had movie theater buckets in it, from the Baghdad Theater in downtown Portland. Since I already knew the movie cold, I worked concessions, bringing stuff to everyone. It was like one of those summer movies in the park back home, and when I came back, I brought two of the Afghans with me for me and Val to relax on and cover up with as the cooler air of the night came in. And that is how eight different alien species came to be watching The Last Starfighter on an uncolonized alien planet. As the movie went on, I wanted to see how the others were reacting to it, but became distracted when Val snuggled into me. It had been way too long since I'd felt that weight of another person on me. And on instinct, I kissed her on the temple as I settled in, and we just laid there on our blanket, watching. At a certain point, I wasn't really watching the movie anymore and just lying there with Val, lightly stroking her hair until she looked up at me. And we paused there for a moment, and I laid one hand on her cheek, not even noticing the shoulder pain, then leaned in, and there, I kissed Val for the first time, and she kissed back. Every fiber of me wanted to deepen it, but there were rather a few people there, so we just sort of stayed there for a while until I heard a slight coughing noise. It was Marilla, who looked like she was a teacher who'd caught us making out behind the bleachers. So, um, the movie is over. I have a lot of questions. Val laughed into my chest and I could feel her blushing. Uh, yeah, just give a minute. Marilla smirked. Only a minute? She walked off and I closed the hollow screen. Uh, I... I really want to continue this, but... Val kissed me. We're the only two humans stranded on an alien world. We've got time. I'm gonna go freshen up. Everyone was waiting around the fire for me, and it was clear that we had not been quite as discreet as we thought we had. Ducky was nearly vibrating. All right, so what did everyone think of the movie? Marilla quirked an eyebrow and her smile was nearly predatory. Oh, it was an interesting affair, to be sure. These movies are common on your world? I nodded, avoiding the baited words. Oh yeah, we make things like that constantly, for over a hundred years now. They vary by what era of filmmaking, genre, and whatnot. And none of those alien races were real? She seemed particularly interested in that point. No, just stuff we made up for our amusement. I shrugged. How many of these movies are there? Marilla was coming to a point. Thousands upon thousands of them. So that's how your species knows so much. You're not a species of geniuses, in so much as you've simply kept making things up. And now, the things you've made up have proven to be at least peripherally true. And... Because you made up so many different things, that's why you're able to think around abilities like the trails possibly better than they can. She said matter-of-factly. She wasn't asking, she was informing her conclusion. I mean, I'm not an expert by any means, but it sounds about right, I reckon. 
Azaku joined the conversation now. And how many of these movies of yours concern humanity fighting against technologically superior species? I held up my hands, trying to find a better answer, but I'd have to stick with the truth. I don't know how many, but it's a lot. But sometimes we also imagine ourselves as the bad guys. Hell, some stories don't even have humans in them at all. Generally, when we make up a species, we use ourselves as the average and make the species around various virtues and vices of humanity, so they're usually more of an allegory for ourselves. Trade cut in. I like Grig. One starfighter against the Armada. He is a strong warrior. We discussed the movie back and forth for a time, answering various questions about humanity, our imagining of the alien species, and other general stuff they liked or didn't like about the movie. It was almost a totally normal discussion, if not for the game, until another thing happened. Ragnar shook his head, throwing up his arms in a way that I had done a few times this past week. I just don't understand how a united species could dream up so many conflicts. I nearly choked on my Dr. Pepper. What? It was my turn to be looking at everyone dumbfounded for a moment before I could respond. Y'all, I'm not sure what ideas you've got in your head, but we are not a united species. Earth's got like 208 sovereign nations, and I promise y'all, sure as shooting, we're fighting each other somewhere in the world right now. Marilla blinked, and her face read that I just told her that the sun rose in the west. That makes no sense. You're this advanced, and you haven't unified? I unified my planet, and we don't half the advances your species boasts. Val came walking over, drying her hair with a spare sweater. Um, did I walk in on something? I was scrambling, trying to figure out how to explain. Look, humans didn't all advance together. Our planet has tons of impediments to that. First off, three quarters of its water. Last I remember learning, but it ain't just that. We've got seven continents, scattered islands all over the place, and natural barriers that cut us off from each other. So everyone just, sorta, came up on their own till we started running into each other again. We had language barriers as well, over time. Azoku eyes narrowed. Seven continents? My own world has but two. I'm not sure about the rest of you. Everyone was now starting to get in on it, and it wouldn't get explained at all. Look, okay, let's back the train up a minute. On about 65 million years ago, Earth only had the one continent, which we call Pangaea. Humans weren't even a thing yet, but an asteroid struck our planet, big one, and it caused what's called a tectonic shift, if and I'm remembering high school right. The continent broke apart and started drifting, till we're where we're at now. There was a ton of smoke and shit that got into the sky, caused an ice age, and it's out of it that humans evolved. Marilla was weighing everything I said, but she seemed to believe me. And when did humans evolve? Well, if YouTube's to be believed, we showed up about 250,000 years ago, but it'd be a while before we really got off the ground. Got a talking round about 50,000 years after that and if was off to the races. I shrugged, not really sure if they would understand the sheer amount of time involved. Your entire species is only a quarter of a million years old? My own species predates you by close to a million years, and we're nowhere near you technologically. Marilla wasn't even arguing now, just assessing, measuring, and counting. I shrugged. Look, y'all, I'm not an expert on this. I know what I was taught in school. And Val's got me beat on that note, on account of actually going to college. We're getting away from the point. Earth ain't nearly united. We've been fighting each other for our whole history. And yeah, we'll mostly link up on the alien thing. But we'll still also be fighting each other, not even just militarily. Azoku came back in, his tail swishing back and forth. What sort of fighting will your people engage aside from military conquest? I mean, we literally have professional fighters. Boxing, martial arts, UFC, various styles of wrestling, shooting competitions. Hell, cooking competitions are a common thing on Earth. Might as well mention the not hurting people stuff. And then we'll compete at video games, survival games. Once watched a couple of army buddies of mine work out how to play an advanced strategy game in the middle of the desert with rocks for pieces and whatever leftover stuff they had around camp. Treg laughed. I like these humans. Wait. How do you compete at cooking? Val smiled and took her moment to step in. Well, it depends. In something like a cook-off, everyone's making the same dish. 
but it's about who can make it better than the other competitors. Then you have competitions where all the contestants get a group of ingredients to use, and it's not only about cooking well, but who can make the best use of the ingredients, the most inventive dish. I used to compete myself. I was an athlete, and good enough to be heading to the Olympics if I hadn't gotten pregnant in college. I competed in a broad spectrum of events called track and field. This included 100, 200, and 300 meter sprints, hurdles at 110 meters, relay races where we run to hand off a baton to our teammate who takes over running to next teammate. Then you've got longer races, 800 meters, 1500 meters on up. Then there's high jump, long jump, triple jump, pole vault. Then we have throwing competitions with javelin throws, hammer toss, discus, and shot put. I was really good in javelin and hammer toss. Val looked wistfully into the night. Marilla jumped in. That's a lot of competitions for just this Olympics. Oh, I'm not done. Then there's the marathon, a 26-mile run, and finally the decathlon and heptathlon. I wanted to be the first woman to officially compete in the decathlon. It's 10 of those events, essentially back-to-back, -back, and that is one Olympic category. There are dozens more events, with the greatest athletes from all over the world competing against one another to see who the best is. There isn't even really a cash prize. It's all for the prestige, and none of that covers the stuff that goes on in the Winter Olympics. Ooh, I know something. Val called up Annabelle and asked her to bring up the footage for the gold medal winning performance for pairs figure skating from the last Olympics. Annabelle shrugged and put up the video. Marilla watched two humans in the middle of the Olympic stadium and showed everyone as they executed their performance. At first, Azoku sniggered. Then, eventually, he was watching with rapt attention like everyone else about a minute in when the male performer sent his female companion spinning into the air while moving effortlessly directing her back onto her feet as she came back down. Shin was the first to speak. Wait, when you kicked me, were you holding back? Uh, yeah, I didn't want to injure you, just get you to stop fighting me. She looked sheepishly at him as she said it. I've never been hit that hard in my entire life. And Shin hopped off, taking some leftover snacks with him. Hoda finally decided to join the conversation, if only briefly. I am one of strongest of the women in my species, and I could not do that. How long do they train for this? Val looked her in the eyes, tearing up a bit. Our whole lives to get even one chance to stand in that stadium. I startled when my wristband beeped, and when I hit the button, it wasn't Annabelle, but Ravaja Tick who came up. Survivor Keith, we need to have a private word. The message cut off, and my privacy mode engaged with a little infinity symbol where the countdown clock was. Welp, apparently our esteemed host wants a word. This'll be fun. Val, can you finish up the questions and answers, please? You're doing a way better job than me at it anyway. I headed off, touching Hearth lightly on the arm as I passed his dormant form and down toward the waterfall until I heard the beep again and hit the button. Ravaja Tick was there, but it was different. He was in an office of some kind, his own I'd imagine and he was didn't have the usual screens going behind him. His entire demeanor had shrunk. May we dispense with the veneers we wear for the show? I smirked. I'm game if you are. He did catch the joke and gave a little alien laugh. Your species has diverted the games a great deal, and apparently you are preparing to do so more. And now species are approaching you, rather than you having to go out to convince them of your intentions. I applaud you humans. Truly, no species that we have known in the history of our dominion has shown the short of cleverness or determination you humans have. The Emperor has taken notice of you. I waited for the tacked-on bit, but it didn't come. And what does the Emperor want? Ravaja Tick sat back. To relieve your burden, he is willing to declare humanity as the victors of pre-warp survival on merit. Val could go home. She could get back to Cassie, her daughter, and not still be trapped here. But... What happens to the other species if we take the deal? They will be taken over by the Cathral Dominion, by the Emperor's command, but you... 
I shook my head. No deal. Ravaja Tick exhaled, crossing his lower arms, laying one arm along the crossed ones, and stroked a hand over his face with the fourth. It wasn't surprise. It was just inevitability. I said you would respond as such when the Emperor spoke to me about this. He will ask why you would not take this deal. Your entire species ascended in one simple decision. I gave my word, and I won't abandon them. But what about a counteroffer? I mean, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? Ravaja Tick started laughing. Not the controlled, forced laughter I had seen previously during broadcasts, but genuine belly laughing. He even seemed to start doing whatever the catharal of honking is as he lost control. A counteroffer, you say? Oh, I would love to hear this one, Keith. Time to bite down hard. We stay in the game, and you come up with three challenges for me. You can make them as hard your emperor thinks is amenable for what I want for completing them. For each challenge, I want one species back from the Talesh, the Migreen, and the Aqualians. There was no laughter, no movement from the Game Master. He just sat there, staring at me for nearly a minute, before speaking again. You really meant you would protect them all? I took my arm out of the sling and for the first time properly stretched it, if slowly. In one of the founding documents of my nation, it reads, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that chief among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, most my people wouldn't take it this far, but they ain't me. I will protect them all. I will find a way to beat your emperor's game, and I will find a way to free the others your dominion has enslaved. This is my war, and it's done when I win, or when I draw my last breath. Ravaj Tik really didn't have much else to say, other than that he would take my counteroffer to the Emperor and signed off, the privacy mode ending as the hollow closed. There really wasn't much else to say, so I was standing there by myself at night. I looked up toward the bluff, seeing the barest of glows from up above. Between fires for the smokers, the stone kiln we'd changed over to an oven, and the actual campfire, we were starting to be more noticeable. However, this was the first unstructured time I'd had since arriving on this planet. Everything had been a rush out of the gate, the next step, the crisis, the next week, threatening an intergalactic empire twice inside of a week, rescues, explanations, and even my own internal issues. Honestly, I just needed some time for myself, and this was the best time I had to do so. I let Hearth know to cut our connection and decided to take a stroll. Sure, the trills would still sense my mind, especially since the neural link, but their part was done now, and I wanted whatever time to myself I could get. He'd already relayed the conversation with the Game Master, so whatever the reaction on the bluff was, it could wait. I took a walk in the woods, looking up. Another that I hadn't done was this, stargazing. Sure, I'd seen the stars and the moon, but I hadn't really seen them. It was different, and finding a suitable climbing tree, I scrambled on up top to get a better look beyond the tree line. The climb was a bit more challenging with one arm, but I managed. The moon was full, and the stars were all shown at full luster, and for the first time, I just stood, viewing out. It really was a beautiful world. I chuckled, remembering an early scene from Men in Black, when Kay's partner talked about how they never just looked at the stars anymore, and I was now standing on another world. I realized I wasn't even looking for Earth. Haphazardly, I was trying to draw constellations in the sky between the most noticeable stars. It was something Grandma loved to do, and it just felt great to finally have the chance to just relax and look out. Jesus, one week. It felt like forever ago since I'd arrived here. So much had happened. Feeling a wistfulness, I reached into the pocket of my jacket and pulled out a wooden flute. I'd whittled together while Val had been running around. I smiled, remembering the Cherokee reservation I'd visited as a scout. They were gearing up for a powwow, and we'd signed up to stay there and help out. At the time, I was upset because other kids got to go help with food, horses, and the other fun stuff, while I got stuck with a bunch of old guys whittling away to make souvenirs for sale. In the end, I had a great time, as they all had a ton of stories, and I made so many flutes like this. I'd made it when I got sick of skinning and braiding bark for ropes and needed a change of pace that occupied my hands. It had five finger holes, 
and I tied on a grouse feather with a strap of leather from the cougar hide. I started playing it, at first just kind of fiddling to make sure it was in order, and once I was sure, I remembered some songs I knew how to play on it. I stand alone from Quest for Camelot went ringing out over the woods. I remembered when Pops found a copy on VHS, and I played it and replayed it so often the tape wore out. I still own both a Blu-ray of it as well as a digital copy. Then I played Looking Through Your Eyes, and my thoughts strayed to Val. I was falling in love with her quickly, and it wasn't hard to see why. Sure, she was beautiful, but she was someone who'd overcome so much and had never lost her passion. She was direct, didn't play games, and was understanding. I could depend on her easily enough, and we'd had literal days of just the two of us. And then I felt ashamed. It wasn't about Kendra, though. It was Cassie, Val's daughter. I had stared the chance for her to get back home right in the eyes, with no threat to Earth, to back there with her, and shut it down without consideration or input from anyone. She was likely to be angry, and I couldn't knock her for that. She'd be in the right to be pissed. I may have potentially cost her her ride home, and all because I couldn't bend on my stance. But if I did pull everyone in, only to then screw off home and leave them to their fates, then I couldn't live with myself. Cassie had to be scared as well, seeing the threats that were out there for her mom, the fights where she could die at any moment, that ever-present threat that she could die in a moment. God, Pop, what do I even do? It's just so big. It's too big. The fates of dozens of species, Earth, this whole thing. I see a path forward, but it all just keeps piling up, one thing after another. I heard a beep from my wristband and looked at it. There was almost no chance Ravajatik could have gotten back to me this fast, and that only left one other. I pushed the button and up popped Annabelle. By the way she was able to look directly at me, I had to guess there was some sort of vision enhancement to the cameras or whatever they were using. Good evening, Keith. I know it's late, and you probably want to get back to camp for some sleep, but I was hoping you might be up for an interview, though I do understand if you say no. I wiped my eyes real quick and chuckled. Why not, Miss Annabelle? She launched directly into the heart of it. So, according to the conversations at camp, it seems you were given an offer by Ravaja Tick and turned it down. Could you maybe give us some insight into your thought process here? Sure. I shrugged, trading flute for pipe, and lighting it as I gave my response. Well, the deal was pretty simple. We get declared the winners by merit, but everyone else loses and gets taken by the Cathral Dominion to serve as slaves. I said no deal. I figure some on Earth are kinda upset at me on that point, but I just... I couldn't go breaking my word to these folks, and the others that are now looking to join us on the back of our offering to shelter them. She nodded in feigned meaningfulness waiting for me to finish. And how does this decision fit in with your overall strategy? Well, I'd sort of talked about it already. My strategy, as you call it, is to break the game, and this deal means it's working. Oh, I expect them to come barreling up my ass for it, but eh, what are they gonna do? Make me survive more? Anything they do is acknowledging that I'm right, and as a group, we can handle whatever they're dishing out. Apologies for the language. She quirked an eyebrow at the apology. It's fine. You're under a lot of pressure there, but I want to focus on that term. Break the game. How do you intend to break it? I already have, Miss Annabelle. Just bringing on the Rathani started it, sure. But add in the others, it's just caused the cracks to widen. When our hosts put out the rules, the whole thing's based on a single outcome. Be the last species surviving. Now, of course, they can't just take out teams, or they'd show their hand and the game stop working. So what happens if we just don't fight each other? What if we all throw in together, to give us the best chance to survive overall? How does the game end if the players stop playing? I took a moment to blow smoke a chain of little smoke rings. Should also say that wasn't the only part. I did put up a counteroffer. Annabelle startled at that one. You made a counteroffer? What was it? I slowly let out a mass of smoke that wrapped around in the air. I'd done it before, and the look made me look just a touch demonic. Pretty simple. I challenge the Emperor to give me three challenges. For each I succeed, I get back one of the eliminated teams, and their world gets spared till the game ends, at least. This was a thin blade to be standing on. By making the deal public, I couldn't be ignored. And more importantly, I could try to sway the crowd. 
just like gladiators in Rome could become so popular that they could make changes in Rome, or just their own condition by becoming a crowd favorite. The blade, however, was in the possibility of pissing off the emperor by airing it publicly. Annabelle took a slow breath before continuing. Why try to get back eliminated competitors? And what are the challenges you'll be facing? I shrugged. Well, to the challenges, I don't know. I only just made the offer, so I gotta wait to see if the Emperor can be convinced to go with it. As to why, it's pretty simple, I reckon. I want them to stay free, and I don't want their homeworlds to be assaulted. I want every one of us to go home from this. We can win. We just gotta work together and stay the course. Really, the world's been pretty agreeable as yet, so the survival end's been work. But nothing compared to Earth so far, even considering the cougar attack. On the subject of the attack, I see that you don't have your arm in the sling right now. How is the healing process going on that? She was calling attention to the viewers as she said it. I stretched my arm out for a moment in demonstration as I replied, It's coming along well, all things considered. It's still sore, that and the ribs. But really, it's doing pretty well. Sling was mostly to keep my shoulder in position to make sure it's lined up right. Now, I'm just working on the physical therapy end, which will take a bit. But all in all, coming along nicely. Annabelle nodded again and then put a hand up to her earpiece. I'm sorry, Keith, but we'll need to cut this interview a bit short. You may want to get back to camp quickly. There's a fight breaking out. As quickly as I could, I cut off the screen and began scrambling down the tree. I closed in, starting to hear the commotion up above. I came up the rise to see Val being held back by Azoku, Ragnar, and Greltha, while Marilla was on the ground being tended by her guard. And if I was seeing it right, the three were losing the fight to keep Val restrained. Everyone stand down and stand the f by. Everyone froze where they were, Val included. Since returning to civilian life, I'd made a conscious effort not to use army voice around civilians since it tended to shock people. But I'd sorta had it. I finally get one goddamned hour to myself in this whole run, and y'all start some schoolyard shit while I'm out? Merla started to speak, and I cut her off. Shut the up. Ducky, what happened? Ducky looked legitimately afraid just then as she hopped forward, which I felt bad about, but not much I could do at the moment as she started in. Well, it was okay at first. I mean, we were all curious about what the conversation was about. Then we got the stuff from Hearth, and Marilla got mad. Val tried to calm her down, and then Marilla said something about her daughter, and Val punched her. Azaku got to her first, but not before she hit her. And then, well, Azaku called for Ragnar and Greltha. The Skrens hid, and Hoda and Traeg started making bets on how long the fight would go. Thank you, Ducky. I turned and marched toward Marilla. Her guard stood up to block me, and fuck, I can't remember his name right now. I punched him in the throat and stepped past him as he fell, calling over to the Traeg to have him restrained. You want to explain to me when you thought that taking a swing at her kid was relevant? I... it's your fault. She stayed on the ground as she spoke. Answer my f question! I was really done with shit like this. I was starting to shake from the anger, and I could feel the pain in my ribs from it. Marilla took a moment and composed herself. There wasn't. I... I lost my temper, and I just... I'm sorry, Keith. I am not the one you owe the apology to. Stand up and hold. And I offered her my hand to help her up. Marilla on her feet, I turned. Val, come here, please. Val came up, not afraid, but still a bit pissed. Val, I was a dad. I get it. And if it was just some daft bitch in a bar, it wouldn't even be a thing. But we're fighting for all our lives here, and we can't be getting into fights like this. What did she say exactly? Val took a steadying breath. Well, when she wasn't getting anywhere with calling me an unfit mother, she decided to call me a slattern, called Cassie a bastard, and she didn't get to whatever it was she was about to say after that. I gave it a moment, nodding. All right, here it is, both of you. We are all on edge here. We've been pushed to the brink for a week, physically, mentally, emotionally, and it's impossible to believe that we're all just going to get along and be friends. All of us are in this to save our people, and that's its own weight on top of everything else. I don't need us to be friends. 
but we have to have respect for each other, or this whole thing goes up in flames. So from now on, and this is for everyone, if you've got an issue with each other, bring it to me. If you guys probably all have issues with me, bring those to me too. I'm in charge, that's the job. Now both of you, apologize for your parts in it, and then hug, brofist, high five, whatever you want to do to signify that this fight ends here and now. I called Ducky back over and knelt down to speak to her. I'm sorry for scaring you, hun. I was mad, but not at you, okay? Can you get Shin and have him let the Skrens know the situation's resolved? She nodded and- Thank you, Keith. And I'm sorry we ruined your alone time. It's fine, Bit. Mistakes happen. And I'm sorry for yelling at you. You didn't do anything wrong. I hugged her before she bound off after Shin. I turned back to see Val explaining what a brofist was to not only Marilla, but Asoku and the goal, who wanted to know what it was now that the fight was stopped. I helped with the demonstration, then went over to where Marilla's guard was. I'm sorry for hitting you. That wasn't about you, so much as getting a point across, not just between them, but the rest of the group, the goals especially. He nodded, but one of the side points of getting throat punched is, well, you're really not in a talking mood. He did, however, hold up a fist for the bro fist, and I obliged. I dispersed everyone and stopped by the Enod tent, where I heard a baby crying. Zara was there trying to soothe her, but nothing seemed to be working. Hey, ma'am. Sorry about the ruckus out there and my part in it. Anything I can do to help? She a long, slow hiss of breath. It's fine, Keith. It's not just the noise, she's cold. Our species doesn't retain body heat well, and I'm doing my best. God damn it, I hadn't asked. I mean, cats on Earth essentially had the same problem, which is why they would tend to sleep on each other and take naps in sunny places where it was warmer. Hang on, we can help with her. First, do you trust me to hold on to her? My species is endothermic. We generate our own heat. She made a motion with her hand and held up the child. Thinking about it, Nogrex hadn't run into an issue, since we'd done nothing but pump him full of warm water and hot broth since he'd woken up from his fainting episode. I turned to walk out of the shelter, but signaled her to come out with me, walking over to the fire with her, as her daughter began to settle from the warmth. Okay, now, I gotta go grab some things, and I'll be right back, okay? What I was after was our stunning trade in jackalope pelts. They were softly furred animals, so I wouldn't need to worry it would irritate the baby's skin. For a while, I just sat at the fire with Zara, offering her some leftover popcorn and snacks, while I grabbed some sticks and reeds that had been gathered for making baskets. I used them to make a basic framework, then added stitched together jackalope pelts to make a backwoods bassinet, complete with some pieces that could be closed over top to hold in the heat a bit better while also making sure the kid would get air. It took a bit, but Zara was positively beaming when I presented it to her. I even pointed out that she could put warm stones from near the fire in the gap at the bottom to provide a heat source and promised to work on some more solutions for them all so they could be comfortable. After mom and baby went off to bed, I was back to my own devices again for a bit. Val was in the shelter, though I doubted she was asleep. Likely she was trying to come down still from the night's events. I decided to let her have her space for the moment since I needed a minute myself. Once everything quieted down, I banked the fires the Rathani wouldn't need, dropped off an extra warming stone for the Anod, and came into my own shelter. Val was laying in my hammock and unless I was very much incorrect, rather unclothed beneath the Afghan and sleeping bag. She had, however, fallen asleep. I'm an idiot. Now my will said, oh yes, we've got this, while my ribs were more like, the fuck you do. However, I was also at least smart enough to know that if I went to her hammock, it would look like I spurned her. So to middle ground, I stripped down myself and gingerly climbed into the hammock with her. She did stir a little bit, but rolled into position, and I kissed her forehead, feeling her body laying against my own. I meant to stay up for a bit and just sort of luxuriate in the moment but I lost that fight fast. I was fully out inside of 10 minutes. It was the first honest night's sleep I'd fully gotten since before this event started. No dreams of another life came to me. No fear when the dreams ended. I even slept late for once, 
and by the time I came to, Val was looking down at me, her curly red hair fully unbound by braids or straps, and my ribs fully lost the fight, and it was all I could do to think to hit privacy mode and think to hearth that we weren't to be disturbed before I lost control of things. When we did eventually exit the tent, it was very clear that everyone knew what had happened. Two telepaths, Asu hearing, and Ducky having no ability not to air every thought she ever had, had seen to that. Even Marilla was smirking as we came over for breakfast, where Azoku offered up a bro fist for me as I took a seat on the rock next to him. As we ate, however, all of our wristbands beeped an alert. We put up the hollow and it was Ravajatik in full game master. Good morning, viewers and survivors, and welcome to another amazing day of pre-warp survival. As our regular viewers well know, we have come to the point in the competition where we will face our first survival event. Oh, Christ, I hadn't accounted for that, but he'd mentioned offhandedly that there would be other rules later. This was one of them, apparently. Ravajatik made a big show of things, clearly taking some joy in whatever responses he was getting. And what is our first event? Well, my viewers, my survivors, it is the Gathering Storm. Our advanced weather satellites are tracking a major storm that will make landfall in just 48 hours. With winds as high as 50 miles per hour, hailstones, and pouring rain, this storm stands as one of the strongest ever recorded in the history of the Cathral. May the Emperor reign eternal. I looked at Val and mouthed, strongest? To which she shrugged, and I looked around the rest of the table as they heard the news. Their reactions were very different than ours. They were terrified. I did a short whistle, signaled Hearth, and sent along my thoughts. Guys, it's fine. Both me and Val have been in worse storms than this. We designed the yurts expecting Earth weather. Unintentionally, this had the effect of showing everyone Earth storms, and what started as incredulous looks turned to sheer shock as they saw the times I'd watch storms roll in, back home, and even the times I'd witnessed tornadoes touch down. Ravaja Tick was still talking as we did this. Now, of course, with such peril at hand, we here at pre-warp survival also have prizes for those who weather the storm's fury. Prizes will be given out to all competitors who are not eliminated due to the storm or by side effects of the storm, such as starvation, injury, hypothermia, or other medical issues. For each survivor, complete the event to get an item to help you in the event to come, and one item from home. Best of luck to all of our competitors. May the Emperor reign eternal. The transmission cut off, and we sat quietly for a moment before I started in. Okay, 24-hour working party. We need those shelters finished quick as we can. We also to need raid all our old campsites for everything left there, and see if we can wrangle up the others. We've got two days to batten down the hatches, and we can do this. While the storm, by all accounts, wouldn't be all that bad by Earth standards, there were still concerns. For one, we didn't have any modern housing to shield us from it, so we were going to need to finish up the yurts and make sure they could stand up to it. We wouldn't be able to build enough for everyone either, yet, Second to that, hailstones. Now, the wind speed wasn't high, at least not by the standards of Earth, but that still leaves us with rocks falling from the sky. My designs had originally just used the tarps for the roof to make it easier on us, but that wouldn't be enough to protect from hail. So thatching roofs just got added to the list. First, we needed folks in the right groups, and Val seemed ready on that count. Okay, top of the order. Treg. I'm pulling you from hunting. You're great, but you're physically the strongest one here, and we need you over with the Rothani on getting lumber. Ducky, Shin, and Skrens need you guys to communicate with everyone where their original camps were, then go scavenge anything you can. Hoda, head down to the river and reset the nets across the full river for right now. We'll need as much as we can before the storm sets in. Marilla, Fionn, and Nogrex will need you all getting firewood, much as you can, and get it somewhere dry, as well at thatch for the roofs. For the rest of us, we'll be getting the building going. Everyone, break after we eat. After breakfast, everyone moved off to their assigned tasks. The Asu went around to everyone and ended up taking Prodigal with them in the Skrens to find the camps quicker as they got descriptions. Hoda replaced the nets quickly and came back up, joining the building team as we laid into it directly. By now, the first shelter was mostly built. The structure was two rings of vertical logs one just outside the other, with a section arranged to allow for a fireplace and a chimney. 
Between those logs, we drop branches and such, creating a level of insulation. If not great, it would at least be something. Then it was a matter of laying out and tying down the tarps on top of the structure, which came down to Val and Hoda climbing up and working. Merla and Fionn made semi-regular trips back, Fionn dragging container shell loads of firewood and brush. I, meanwhile, began lashing doors together. Ensuring they were properly measured and could pivot was more fiddly than difficult. There was a sweet spot to it so that the door would stay mostly still but not be difficult to open and be insulated as well. Then there was the matter of latching. On the inside, I made a strap and hook to be able to lock the door from the inside, while on the outside, an actual latch was used. I had to redo it a couple of times to get it done properly, but that's just how things work in the wilderness. Try a thing that should work, find out it doesn't, swear, try again, swear, and repeat the process until it's all functional. It was a few hours later as I was laying down my completed doors that my wristband beeped, and by reaction, so did Val's. Hitting the green button, up popped Annabelle, and the look on her face was dire. Afternoon, Miss Annabelle. I reckon now ain't the beat. Keith, listen, they showed us footage of the storm, some of it the initial view of the storm forming, but they've been giving us a live feed of it, and their estimates are off, way off. She said, all trace of the anchor woman missing from her talk. Their readings are from when the storm first started forming, and they haven't been tracking it much since. It got bigger, somewhere in the neighborhood of Cat 1. Right now, though, it's back building along from the mountains to the northeast of your position. Shit. And how is it they ain't got this info, Annabelle? Annabelle shrugged. Our best guess is that they're telling the truth. The storm they're pointing out to you is the worst storm their species has ever recorded. As in, at all. I'd be very surprised if they bothered advancing their meteorology past the necessity point. Fuck. It made sense. Meteorology on Earth had only truly advanced because it was necessary, because storms on Earth could be so incredibly severe, including such fun as tropical storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, and blizzards, and each with their own categorizations of how much the storm would be capable of destroying. Fundamentally, if the Catherall had never had to be on the receiving end of worse than a tropical storm, then they wouldn't be likely to devote significant research to that point. All right, Miss Annabelle, so figure it's back building. If it's a one now, that'll put her, what, two, possible three when she drops on us? Annabelle nodded soberly as my wrist beeped again, and pressing the button now brought up Ravaja Tick alongside Annabelle. Survivor Keith, we here with the Cathral Dominion, may the Emperor reign eternal, noticed your conversation with your liaison. What do these numbers mean? Give me a sec, Rav. Gotta get folks squared away real quick. I said, turning. Val, storm's gonna be a two or a three. We need windbreaks along the ridge line. Val swore and started directing Hoda, and I turned back to my screens. All right now, y'all. Where were we? Right. Miss Annabelle, could I get your help on showing him images and whatnot? Figure this'll go quicker if we got something to show him. Rav, the cat stands for a scale we use for storms on Earth. It's a measure of size, general wind force, how much the sucker eats or destroys, as far as storms go. Now, to put it to you in a way y'all get, the storm you told us about wouldn't make the scale, just a tropical storm, and off we trot. Sure, it's not great if you're off in the woods like, but it ain't nothing to write home about if you catch my meaning. Cat 1 is where it starts to pick up. There are six categories, and we use them to rate things like hurricanes, tornadoes, and other severe storms. Ravajatik showed interest in this, leaning forward a little. You keep mentioning these. Tornadoes. What are they? Oh, God damn it! Well, damn. Miss Annabelle, while I talk about this, could you have your boys in the booth bring up a string of videos of tornadoes from F0 to F5? I'll need to be showing him or he won't get it. Basically, Rav, the naders are wind funnels that are sometimes created due to storm fronts on Earth. Particular regions, such as my home state of Tennessee, are sorta in the perfect spot for them, and we get them pretty much every year around the same time since that's when the conditions for it come together. Annabelle brought up a video of a small tornado moving along. Ravaja Tick eyes bugged out at the sight. And this? This is a real weather event on Earth? I moved Annabelle's screen so that I could use it the same way a weatherman would, 
while keeping my focus on Ravagetic. Sure is shooting, buddy. Now this right here is an F1 tornado. You're looking at sustained wind speeds of 75 to 110 miles an hour. 110 miles per hour? Ravagetic wasn't just being the host at this point. He seemed legitimately terrified at the concept. Yes, sir. Sustained, not gusts. Now again, this sucker's an F1. After 112, we pick us up on F2 tornadoes, and they'll go up to about 157 miles per hour. Miss Annabelle's team's been kind enough to provide an example of one for us now. And stepped a little away from the screen to let Ravagetic and the viewers get a closer look on their own. Ravagetic looked ill as he began speaking again, obviously having been signaled by someone off camera that he had dead air. I... I don't believe we need to see the other videos on the subject, Survivor Keith. How did humans learn to avoid these sorts of natural disasters on Earth? I cocked my head. Avoid? Yes, avoid. So, obviously your people would need to be more nomadic, moving away from the afflicted areas during the season of occurrence each year. Ravajatik was feeling much easier now. Uh, we don't. People live there. And I mean, hell, going out on the porch to watch the storm roll in's nearly a national pastime. He was agape. You, you, why would you stay there? Look, Mr. Rav, you don't get it. Let's say we got our asses out of there like you want, right? If and we go east to the coast, it's hurricanes instead of tornadoes, and we might still get the tornadoes. If we head out west, we got big mountain storms and the desert to the south. West of that, and we got the west coast wildfires every summer. Going north, we got blizzards and whatnot on up there. And south, well, that's just getting us both the tornadoes and the hurricanes. So I mean, six of one, half dozen of the other. Other places even got worse stuff, like Hawaii has volcanoes erupting on it. Went to see it one time. It was pretty neat. I closed Annabelle's window in front face to Ravage tick. Look, what you're not getting here is pretty simple. Our world's been trying to kill us for a quarter of a million years that we've existed as a species, and it has failed, spectacularly at that. So yeah, we're pretty well versed in these sorts of things, Mr. Rav. Don't expect we'll have as much trouble making it through this upcoming storm. I closed the final screen and turned to see Merla and Fionn return from their most recent wood gathering run, and Merla was staring at me. You don't expect any trouble? Marilla didn't wait for my reply, bringing the rest of the supplies in and taking a rest. I shrugged and went back to work. All right, folks. Now, it's going to be a minute here, but welcome back to Uncle Keith's Alien Survival Hour. As y'all are no doubt aware, seems we got us a big ol' storm fixin' to hit us here. Now, of course, on Earth, this wouldn't be all that bad, since we get storms like this a bunch. Mosley, it's a bit boring for a few days, and we just go on about our lives. Here, though, we're gonna have to be taking it seriously. I grab supplies for the next bit. We've got the first shelter just about finished over here. And after the storm passes, we'll be using some of the clay to cover the outer walls, really get the sucker closed in. Why not now? Well, for one, we're not sure when the rains are going to start coming down, and don't know if in the clay is going to have enough time to dry, so it'd be wasted effort. Other part of it has to do with the winds we're expecting. See, it's a basic thought to try and fully cut the interior off from the wind, but it can be a problem here. Instead, these walls will act as windbreaks, letting the wind pass through and breaking it up around the two rows of logs and the branches and brush we're using to insulate the shelter. That'll keep us moving along and keep the storm winds from blowing us out completely, drafty as it might make the place. But hey, let's get us a look inside here now, since we'll be getting pretty familiar with this place in the next few days. Using the newly applied door, I stepped inside. Looking round here, we've got the fire in the middle, with a rigged chimney going up to a small hole in the top of the yurt. Yurts, by the way, have been used on Earth for thousands of years, especially in areas like Mongolia. Now we did use stones and clay in the chimney. Pretty simple. With the fire we got going, and the roof being on, the clay will have the time it needs to dry and harden, forming a kind of mortar for the stones we got. By keeping the fire in the center, we can keep the whole place evenly warmed and away from the wooden walls, so it ain't gonna accidentally burn our shelter down. I moved around to where we'd made up the first beds. Here, we've got our sleeping arrangements. Raised beds are good, but they're critical on out here. A raised bed means being up away from ground insects and water. 
These were made using the rope we've been making for a bit, cross-hatched, so the entire rig's taking the weight when someone lays down. This particular bed's for our proud new mama and papa, and we've got us a space for the baby on next to it, so they can keep a weather eye out. Now, unfortunately, mom and dad are gonna have roommates for a bit, since we ain't got enough time to finish all of the shelters we're gonna need. With 48 entrants, figuring two per shelter, we're gonna need us 24 total shelters at the end of it, building down the bluff as we go. Ones at the bottom might not even be yurts. They work for what we need, but there are other shelter types we can use that'll give us some options. So like, the Skrens and Asu are both used to live in in burrow-like shelters. Kinda like Hobbit Homes on Earth from the Lord of the Rings movies for my human folks watching at home. For them, we'll be making pit shelters. I'd have used them up here, but the ground here ain't deep enough to support it. Roofs themselves are pretty straightforward. We're using the tarps we've been collecting for them, then laying thatch over top of that. Tarps keep the rain on out, and combined with the thatch, it helps out on insulation. This way, hopefully, it'll stay cooler on the hot days, and warmer on the cold days. We'll need to be keeping an eye on it, and make adjustments as we go along. Now, aside from that, you'll notice there ain't much in here, and that's fine for now. Later we're hoping to make table and chairs, and some other of them their accoutrements for the shelters. But I reckon for now, we're more concerned with making sure everyone's got somewhere to sleep for a few days. I continued on as I inspected, making sure all the ties were proper, that there weren't any significant gaps in the insulation, tarp, or door. I also took a moment to mark out potential spots for some windows. Then I went to work with the next shelter, which was coming along a bit faster. Finishing one up had shown everyone the process, so the second one was just a matter of repeating the maneuvers from the first, minus all of the explanations. Using my good arm and a couple of steps, I got myself up on the wall and helped getting the frames for the roof laid out, lining up the tarp and getting insulation in. While Hoda was on break and I had as close to a private moment as possible, I hit privacy mode. Hey, uh, Val? She was nimbly coming around the wall, checking over her work securing the bottoms of the roof frame. What you need, Keith? I focused on some lashing work as an excuse to linger. Well, about last night. She paused and looked up, smiling a bit. Hey, if you want to keep things casual. I want to take a more formal if you don't mind. I'd blurted it out, using checking the lashing as a focus so I didn't have to see the initial reaction. Thing is, I'm not sure which is more terrifying. Her saying no, or hey saying yes. I mean, on the one hand, rejection sucks, but I mean, at least it's over then. Yes raises the stakes, it means I've got more to lose, and especially right now in this game, it could be a costly weakness. End of the day, though, I wanted her more than I wanted to stay safe. We'd known each other for a little over a week, but it had been a hell of a week, and I knew I wanted more, whatever the cost to that was. Val didn't speak for a moment. She just seemed to be appraising me or maybe herself, before she spoke. I, I mean, I want to, but... I chuckled. Yeah, I get it. The game, the situation, our pasts. Could probably pick a dozen things are wrong about this whole thing. But the truth is, I don't fucking care. I care what you think of me, and that's really about it. I knelt down just as I started to say I didn't care, and looked her in eyes as I told her that her opinion of me is what I cared about. Val's breathing had shifted, and I could see color rising in her cheeks. Keith, it's not as simple as that for me. I mean, Cassie. Nothing about relationships stays simple, hun. Grandma and Pop Pop, my mom and dad, they all really loved each other. But I'll be honest, it was never simple. And it ain't gonna be simple with us. And I get it. You got a daughter. Not my first rodeo on that count. I get it. She's your world. I'm just asking if I can get a chance to be a part of it. Sides, I'm pretty certain she saw movie night. So assuming she understands you kissing me a whole bunch, pretty sure she's farther along on this thing than us. I laughed again at the last bit. Val's gaze dropped. It's a lot to consider for me. I'm not saying no, but for now, it just has to stay as simple as we can manage, given everything. As you wish. I nodded and hopped down off the wall, sighing as I hit ground. It hadn't been a no, but it hadn't precisely been a yes either. I just have to take things slowly, 
and hope it would eventually work itself out. Hoda was leaning against the wall of the yurt and was clearly grinning, speaking low. Eh, she will come around, and if she does not, I will take you. She then hopped back up on the wall, leaving me standing there blinking. Well, okay then. I deactivated privacy mode and went back to work. I decided to check the river, and sure enough, our gill net was full of fish now, so I went ahead and wrapped the net around the lot, using it as its own kind of bag to haul floaters back up to camp. Not exactly comfortable on one arm, but I could manage. Coming back up into camp, I set about gutting and cleaning and cutting up the floaters, then putting them in the smoker to let that work. It was at capacity at this point, and if I had my count correct, we had more than enough to ride out the storm. I was finishing up and taking a much-deserved break when Hearth came over. We have people incoming. Their minds are a bit different. Hey guys, we got visitors. I'll take Marilla and Hearth with me. The three of us got together, heading down with some extra food and water to meet our newest guests. I saw them, the Hilgos, as we came down the switchback. They stood proudly, but I could see from a ways off that they looked thinner than when I'd first seen them on the beach. They were an avian species with looks reminiscent of a bald eagle, giving them a more austere look. While they didn't seem to possess wings, it was evident in the way their arms moved that they must have had them at some point in their evolution. It looked almost like the skin on a flying squirrel and might allow them some sort of limited glide ability. They looked extremely winded, despite likely just walking to get here, even if they had been pulling their equipment with them. It wasn't a good sign. As we got closer, I called out, Hi there, I'm Keith, this Marilla, and this is Hearth. Welcome to our little village. You guys carnivores, omnivores, or herbivores, we got you covered for food in any event. Hearth was clearly projecting my sentences to them, and as they caught up with my speech, the smaller, slighter ones stepped forward, communicating in a series of whistles, squawks, and such until the words started to come through. Kestra, and this is my broodmate, Brecon. We will eat anything you're willing to give us, but we come with a warning. This storm is bigger than the Game Master said it was. We can feel the vibrations of it in the distance. I cocked my head to the side. Huh. So y'all can sense things like the electromagnetic spectrum, can you? That's certainly good for us. Have a seat. We'll get some food and water in you. Then we'll take the walk up. Sitting on some stump where timber had been felled before, we had ourselves a late lunch, eating and drinking together. The hill goes eating like they'd never seen food before, or would again. So I'll take it that y'all are pretty hungry? The one identified as Brakin responded emphatically, We haven't eaten in days now. At first we fished the coast, but some predators in the water started attacking our lines and wrecked our nets. We tried hunting the interior, but we came across one of the big cats, and it was too much. We ended up having to flee up trees and hide from it. I nodded sagely as I ate some fish. Yeah, I had my own run-in with those things. Y'all did the right thing there. Our nets are still good. We've been fishing the river on the other side of the bluff and just brought in a major haul. We're smoking the fish now, so we should be good till the storm clears. The Hillgos went over their experiences since they'd been brought here, and it hadn't gone well for them. They'd started out near the coast, like several others, and it had to turn into a back and forth, competing for fishing spots, fresh water, basically everything. If it hadn't been for Val's speech about bringing everyone together, they were on the edge of either having to quit or be pulled out. Even now I saw signs of bleeding. Did you injure yourself? Brecken looked at this arm. Oh dear, it would seem so. It's fully covered by the suit, though. I almost went straight forward with first aid, then stopped. Brecken was right. I would have to remove the suit from his arm. Why? Because it was fully closed. But if it was fully encased, then where was the cut? Usually I would have pressed a button on the shoulder getting rid of the suit layer, but instead I pulled the fabric out from his arm and cut it with a knife, careful not to cut open any further wounds. For a moment, nothing happened, other than there being a hole in the arm of the suit and being able to at least somewhat inspect the cut itself. Then quickly but quietly, the suit resealed the breach, even as I still held a small strip of fabric that I'd cut away. There was no seam, nothing. In fact, there were no seams anywhere on any of the suits, as far as I could remember. 
there also weren't any wires I could detect either. So how did the suits register the button presses? And where was the power supply? I busied myself for a moment by taking care of Bracken's arm, but it was pretty cut and dry, so my mind went back to work on what I was thinking with regard to the suits. With Bracken and Kestra pulled together, I had Hearth escort them up, but I asked Marilla to hang back a moment. Hey, I need your help testing something. It's about our suits. Marilla's head went to the side. Yes, I saw something pass through your eyes, and apparently you're really an incredible medic because your mind was nowhere near fixing Brecken's arm, yet you missed not one step of care. Really, that's just practice, but thank you. Hang on for a second. I said, pulling my knife out. I put my other arm out, asking Marilla to pull some of the fabric away from my arm, as far as she could manage. She did, and it stretched. Careful not to clip Marilla's knuckles, I cut out a small section of the fabric rather than just opening a smaller area like I had with Brecken. Marilla, drop that piece on the ground for a moment. I need to test something. She did as instructed, and I watched the hole on my arm. Again, at first, nothing seemed to happen. Then, activity. The sides of the hole shrank steadily until it sealed over once more, a perfect match to the rest of the suit. It didn't even feel any tighter, and I looked at the ground. The scrap I'd cut off was still there. Both Marilla and I cursed, nearly simultaneously, myself saying, My and Marilla, I'll be damned. She picked the piece back up and examined it. It seemed essentially inert and wasn't growing, but her eyes narrowed. Cut off another piece. I did as asked, and with the second piece cut out, the process occurred again, sealing the breech hole. Marilla, meanwhile, beamed. This is interesting. I mean, the suit seems to regenerate itself. Can we cut a larger piece off and it will still regrow? The vision of what this looked like for the viewers at home and our folks up on the bluff had to have been both strange and hilarious. Step one, we shall strip down to survival suits in the wild of an alien wilderness. Step two, begin cutting off larger and larger sections of the suits from each other. Step three, laugh like maniacs at a line of thought only we vaguely understood. Then as we were picking up the cutoffs, an interesting thing happened. Two of the pieces, brought within inches of each other as I picked them up, started straightening out, each piece almost reaching for the other. I let them finish closing, and suddenly, instead of two smaller pieces of the suit fabric, I now only held a single larger piece. I did this again and again, Marilla now feeding more pieces to it, and the fabric continued its growth. The growth, however, only seemed to happen when one of us was holding both pieces we were trying to connect. Fabric on the ground, or pieces held by each instead of one of us, remained inert. We tested it a few more times until Val was coming down from the bluff. What are the two of you doing down here? I held up the fabric, speaking excitedly. Our suits. They regrow. Like, these were all trimmings from our suits. I sound insane. Okay, hang on a second. Marilla, help me cut off part of my sleeve. We went through the motions, and again, the fabric bound itself to the main piece perfectly. Val's jaw dropped. Holy shit! How? How is it doing that? I held up my work. I think it's some sort of, like, nanite-infused fiber. Um, Marilla, nanites are tiny, microscopic robots. Can't be seen by the naked eye. Figure they pull a charge from the natural flow of electricity we produce, and y'all have a power source. The buttons don't actually control the suit. They control the nanites in the suit. This is awesome. I reckon we got an infinite supply of this stuff. We could make rain catchers, canopies between shelters, hammocks, sails, whatever we need it for. Hell, we could make enough to build a frickin' windmill if we wanted. Those weren't the only tricks available. I cut both sleeves off of my suit, and while they didn't grow back the sleeve, they did essentially make themselves a proper sleeveless shirt, even if the hems were a bit rough. I could then put the sleeves back on, and they would rebind almost instantly. I could do the same with the feet, the leggings, and so forth, quickly tailoring my suit how I wanted it to be, while still having it in case of needs. Val also went sleeveless, got rid of the midriff and sockless, cutting her leggings off just above the knees, but instead of just ditching them entirely, she cut fabric holes in a section of freed fabrics, 
putting it on like a pair of fingerless gloves. And sure enough, the nanofibers completed the shaping, a likely pre-programmed response. Oh, much better. God, you have no idea how annoying this suit's been to work with. Merla, meanwhile, hadn't been slacking. Unlike us, however, she was more about quality than quantity of things she could do. Her cuts, unlike ours, looked properly hemmed, whereas we just straight up looked like we'd been shredding our clothes. Marilla, how did you... She beamed. Oh, it was simple. Watch. I have this stripped-down stick here, right? So we lay it on this strip of the fabric and roll it over the stick until it meets back up with the fabric, and there, we have a perfect hemline ready to go. I was looking at what she did. The stick was still through it, making it look rather large for a hem. But as soon as she removed the stick, the fabric shrunk back down, forming a perfect hem. Something occurred to me and grabbed another scrap of fabric, doing the same thing, but after the hem formed, instead of pulling the stick, I took my knife out and cut along the line just past where the fabrics had bonded together. Pulling it clear, I removed the stick and it shrunk down as before, now rendering it into something about as thick as a strand of paracord. Testing it, it was fairly strong, really. I repeated the process again, and then picking up both of them, put them closer to each other, and at first nothing happened until both ends suddenly seemed to snap to each other and combine. I now had a longer piece of the alien cord, as I decided it would be called. It gets better. We can make rope. I don't need to shave any more tree bark. We went back and forth, getting enough fabric together to make three proper lengths of rope. I laid them out going away from each other, using my knife to draw an essentially even triangle to measure the points, and carefully moved the three strands together at the ends. As before, a second or two, and then they moved together. I grabbed the collection, examining them, to see they had formed together perfectly, as all other, and without hesitating, started braiding it into proper rope, then connected the alien cord strands at the other end to finish off my nanofabric rope. Huh. Cool. Val, hold this. Val took secure hold of the rope, and I started pulling away from Val. The rope went taut, but nothing seemed to happen aside from that. Then I let all my weight go backwards, and while Val did need to use both hands, changing stance to keep from getting it dragged, aside from that, the rope wasn't offended by the added weight. Oh, we're gonna need to test this bugger out on some real weight. Test, as it turned out, meant grabbing one of our handy-dandy container shells and lashing it to hang from a branch. The container shell measured 24 inches across, 60 inches long, and 18 inches deep. From there, we just started dumping rocks and such into the container, checking and rechecking the fabric rope. It held taut, no frays, and finally, as we were just looking a bit more into the shell, there was a loud break and the shell hit the ground. It was not the rope that had snapped, it was the branch, having had far more weight put to it than what it was able to work with. Well, hell, reckon that's as good a sign as any. I mean, some downsides to it, but great rope. Gotta be about a ton of rocks in there, and it was the branch that broke. Marilla startled a lit. How is nigh indestructible rope a bad thing? I looked over to Val. I believe you'd be more able to answer that one, hun. Then went to sit for a moment on a nearby rock and have myself a short smoke. Val nodded and turned to Marilla. Okay, so yeah, an unbreakable rope is great in theory, but like... Let's say we're climbing one of these mountains around us, and I start falling. Of course the rope catches me, but you're still tied off to my line, and the tie-offs start to pull away from the rock face. There are only two options. I cut the rope to save the rest of the climbers, or we all fall and die as the ropes rip out of the stone. A self-healing rope does nothing to stop the fall, but it'll just about prevent option one. So what's left? Rilla blinked and didn't meet Val's eyes. You would kill yourself? Val shook her head. Hey, it's not like I want to kill myself. She hazarded a look toward me a second, mouthing an apology, and turned when I shrugged with a smile. But in that sort of situation, where it's my life or all our lives, I'd like to think I would make the choice to spare the rest of you. Marilla considered for a moment. Your species is way too cavalier about dying, but thank you. I slung up. Well, as may be, but there's another issue. Tension. 
Ship's line on Earth is real strong, has to be. When I had to serve on one of the hospital ships, they had us watching a video regarding why not to be straddle in line on the ship's deck. Under pressure, if the line on a ship breaks, it'll rip across the deck at the speed of a bullet, and enough to force to rip your leg clean off. It's got the strength and force to rip a guy like Trag in two. Strength's a trade-off, so we need to make sure we're not putting it to its proper limit. She nodded. Aye, ships I'm familiar with. Okay, but this still solves a ton of work for us. We have almost infinite fabric and strong rope to work with. This should let us tie everything we need down for the storm. I mean, it's not a watertight fabric, which would be better, but even as it is, we just got some pretty significant advances out of this. Wait. We both snapped too, looking to her. A realization had struck. Is... is this how humans advance? You get something trying to kill the lot of you, and you just screw around with an idea until it can save you all? Val and I looked at each other for a few moments before she shrugged and nodded, and I responded, I mean, it's a mite more complicated than that, but I reckon that's about on target. Hey everyone, hope you loved the video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe for more awesome sci-fi content. You can also support us by hitting the thanks button or becoming a channel member. Your generosity helps us bring you more stellar stories. Every bit counts. Thanks a bunch.